We're in Tarragona. It's the 28th. Is it? Perhaps. Of July 2008, we're with Professor Ant Jakobsen from Copenhagen Business School. Welcome to Tarragona. Thank you very much. First. Um, we know you as Mr. Technology down yes. here, the man who has big research projects using technology to study translation. Is that a fair characterization of your contribution to translation studies, do you feel? Um, well, it's not entirely inaccurate, I would say. Um, I think the main contribution um, is in that I have helped um, push the interest, promote the interest in process studies, um, particularly perhaps in uh, this phenomenon of triangulation. Uh, that is to say that we want to support hypotheses um, based on our study of qualitative data. We want to complement that with mm -hmm. um, conclusions based on harder data. And in order to do that, it was necessary for me to try and devise a way of getting at those harder data. And what I thought of was translog and keystroke logging. And this was back... So you're the inventor of translog? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I thought of it... Can you explain what that is? What it is? is. Yes. Well, it's a very simple program, basically, because what it does um, is to record keystrokes um, and the time intervals between keystrokes. And by doing so, you get this long record of, uh, of um, alternating keystroke information and what they call time of day information. And on the basis of that, you can then replay the whole typing process. You can speed it up or slow it down to study the, uh, to study the progress of it. Um, but you can also do what we call a linear representation where you see what keystrokes were made, how they were edited. You can observe very accurately what the intervals were. And then you can begin to speculate on why um, the intervals are not identical, why there are pauses between words, why there are pauses between longer segments, and that these pauses are not uh, of the same length, and try to speculate the, on the extent to which these phenomena are related to cognitive processing. Mm -hmm. So that was where this started. And the problem, as I see it now with translog, well, I shouldn't talk about problems perhaps before talking about um, some of the merits, because one of the things that we discovered very quickly when we started experimenting and using students was that they immediately found out that it was a program that could be used for something that I hadn't thought of, namely to um, raise their awareness of their own working processes. Mm -hmm. So they um, liked to mirror their own activity uh, in the replay and felt that there was knowledge to be gained from that. And this opened up suddenly new potential of the program. And this, in fact, has been uh, perhaps the most gratifying um, feature of it all, that I thought of something that I felt I needed in my personal research. And then when other people saw the tool, they were able to think of new applications. And in fact, only yesterday you were there at the lecture and, and one of the um, members of the audience came up with this idea that it must be uh, a tool that could be used also to enhance or improve second language acquisition. Well, I, it hasn't been used for that as far as I know. I don't know how well this would work, um, but it would be an interesting um, extension of the program. Mm -hmm. If, if you're using triangulation, then translog can only be part of the picture. Yes, is that because exactly. you want perspective. What, yes. what, are, what are the other? What's the other point? Okay, so program? well, traditionally it would be think aloud, or uh, it would be interview data. Mm -hmm. So if you were basing conclusions on interview data, or think aloud was the was the dominant. Uh, this is where the translator verbalizes. Verbalizes. The idea is that you verbalize whatever is um, 
available in verbalized form already in short-term memory. So the founders of this methodology, Erickson and Simon, were claiming that um, it is possible to verbalize whatever is already available in verbalized form in short-term memory without affecting the primary process. And this, it was this central claim that I felt we could either support by um, doing experiments where we contrasted uh, think aloud with experiments, identical experiments, without think aloud, but where everything was logged, the keystrokes were logged in translog. And it turned out that there was indeed not only a delay mm -hmm. when you did tra when you did, did think aloud concurrently, but there was also a change in the way in which um, chunking uh, okay. of um, sentences or of, um, of of phrases of the linguistic material was done, which indicates that there was indeed an influence on the nature right. of the process. So. Um, well, alternative. So, so this has to be taken into account. I, it doesn't mean that um, you cannot, that you should not use think aloud, um, but that you should be aware of this um, effect that uh, think aloud has on the primary process. An alternative that we have suggested is to is to do uh, retrospective interviews immediately after an experiment. Um, and the special method that we have used is to reinforce this by replaying. So, so after um, a participant has translated a passage and we will interview them, then we repay, replay the uh, typing process. And this has an incredible effect on the accuracy of their recollection. Mm -hmm. They're able to perfectly identify what went on, or at least this is the impression. Or, or is it self-justification? Well, the there is that danger. This okay. is something. Yeah. This is the the the, uh, this is the challenge when you're working with qualitative data. Always mm -hmm. that um, participants do a lot to please the researcher or to justify their own intelligence, to flatter themselves, and so on. Mm -hmm. So all of this, of course, has to be taken into consideration. But nevertheless, you get. It, it looks as if we're getting wonderfully targeted information, which I don't think they would be able to uh, create on the spot as quickly, mm -hmm. because you get these aha, uh, uh, um, uh, erlebnisse, uh, uh, very often. Yeah, they know immediately what was the problem. And so in this way, we achieve um, at least, well, two things, you might say. On the one hand, we um, get an experiment where there is no interference from think aloud and on the other hand we get written detailed information almost of the quality or perhaps even of identical quality to what we would be getting in think aloud. Mm -hmm. What about eye tracking as you're using Well, um, this was something that um, uh, became a desideratum um, because obviously when you have uh, only keystroke um, data, um, you get the data that come at the tail end of the process. So keystrokes um, represent the result of all of the uh, mental translation work that goes on. And so you're only getting the last end of the process at best. You're getting these wonderful pauses, but they don't speak. And they, you don't know whether the pause was caused by, by forward planning or by monitoring that, uh, pointed, that point the other way or whether they were just a blank and looking nowhere. And you don't, but if we could combine keystroke logging with eye tracking, we would then be approaching the other end, the mm -hmm. beginning of the mm -hmm. whole process. And at least we would know where the eyes were during a pause if these two could be perfectly synchronized. Mm -hmm. So this is what this was the, the the basic idea in a way of the I to IT project um, that we I formulated with two other people essentially 
uh, three of us got together. One from the University of Tampere in Finland, who is a computer scientist, and one who's a, a cognitive linguist, Maxim Stamanov, from the New Bulgarian University. And the three of us created the uh, project proposal uh, from this core idea of um, initially only combining keystroke logging and eye tracking. Then about just a few weeks before we submitted the proposal, EEG recording was also added um, and um, we have not and we are not going to succeed in fully integrating that because the nature of that data is quite different. Mm -hmm. But the core idea is quite strong, I think, of combining eye tracking, very informative. It tells us um, things that we didn't know, I think, mm -hmm. about translation. For instance, that the, the work done by the eyes differs uh, quite considerably depending on uh, whether we um, ask participants to read with a view to translating a text later um, then they will focus more on certain aspects of the text than if they are asked simply to read for comprehension only. And the, the places that they focus on um, are the result of a kind of pre-translation that they're engaging in because, because we read for a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and we have compared also with the kind of attention that is paid to a text if you ask a participant to site translate that text. So you have to read it for comprehension because otherwise you don't have anything to, uh, to, to translate. Uh, but you also have to monitor your own production of the translation. And this involves reading and rereading and, and reminding the brain apparently of where you are. So that increases the uh, number of fixations that the eye tracker shows us by a factor of about three. And then it explodes if you ask people to do a written translation. And we're up by a factor of, uh, of more than 10 uh, overall. Because there, the, uh, the nature of the task is radically different. Uh, for a very simple reason, you're dealing with, um, with two texts that you have to align. I'd like to know how you got into this. If we go back to when you were 23 or 24 or around there, you weren't doing this sort of work, were you? Um, that would have been roughly the day that I saw the Beatles, I think, oh, for the whoa. first time. Oh, yeah. great story. Uh, <laughs> my hair was about the length of the Beatles also yeah. then. Um, this was, um, well, no, it was maybe two or three years after this, after I first saw the Beatles, uh, we were getting close to 1968. Mm -hmm. I'd been on a visit to uh, the University of Bristol in England. Well, I'd been there for almost a full academic year. I was studying English literature, mm -hmm. uh, preparing an MA thesis on Joseph Conrad. I should have explained, you are Danish. Yes. Despite the perfect English. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> no, I'm not speaking my own language. Uh, anyway, um, so it was Joseph Conrad, but mainly we were spending time wearing um, long red scarves and, um, and black jackets and um, sitting in cellars, um, drinking lots of tea and with with posters of Che Guevara all around <laughs> us, <laughs> uh, and uh, reading fascist poetry, I would say, modern, so modernist English, Ted Hughes type okay. um, yeah. poetry. So this was before some of us, as we said, exchanged our consciousness. Some, some people uh, then overnight became hardcore Marxists um, and in, suddenly lived in communes and it was a wild uh, time uh, back in the... Um, I was in England and missed May 1968 for that reason. But I came back, graduated in 1972 um, with my English major and suddenly there was a job that was offered at Copenhagen University and um, 
and uh, I, two you, jobs in you fact. You were teaching English literature. Uh, so I taught for okay. 13 years. Mm -hmm. I taught English literature at Copenhagen University. So how do you get from mm -hmm. literature to technology? Is that a logical progression? It's certainly not a logical progression. Um, how do you get from it? Um, it's not that I was dissatisfied with teaching literature. I've always loved that. And occasionally I still regret uh, not having that as a part of my professional career, I must mm. say. Uh, but the regret is not all that strong because I think I've always enjoyed what I've been doing. That's uh, uh, an enormous privilege, I think, being able to do whatever you uh, fancy. And I, I mean, my, um, my background is a, is a business background. I'm from a family of grocers. Fundamentally, um, and 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 a few, and then uh, on my mother's side, we've always been interested in new gimmicks and mm -hmm. even inventions. I had um, my uh, maternal grandfather's brother was a bit of an inventor. My my maternal grandfather was the first to buy a telephone, and the first, I think, also to buy a radio where he lived. So we've been interested okay. in new technology okay. in the enough. family. Okay, there Fair may be enough. something there. Um, but I think the main push was that for some reason, even those of us who had grown up doing traditional uh, humanities uh, studies, we felt in the 1980s that in order to do that more scientifically, um, we would have to be programmers. Uh, because suddenly it was possible to um, automatically analyze these enormous corpora of text mm -hmm. and you could get all kinds of interesting information. So I tried to learn programming about the middle of the 1980s, never got very far into it. I had a, a six-year-old son sitting on my knees while I was trying to make the computer repeat my name a, um, a, a thousand times. <laughs> and, and very quickly, he was much better at, uh, okay. at programming than I was. And he was the one who, when he was 15, in fact, programmed the first That's DOS awesome. version yeah. of Translog. And he's been the programmer of it okay. ever since. If you were starting to do research now, what would you be working on? What do you think we should be working on now? And, and you're saying that we should not all be working on um, better medicine and nanotechnology well, in, so the field of translation. in the field of yeah. translation. Yeah. Um, well, I, translation is fascinating, I think, because um, it is the bridge, um, a bridge uh, that brings us into contact with the, all, all the cultures of the world, ideally, mm -hmm. without imposing our own culture on them up without imposing our own values. I know this, I've been accused of taking a romantic view of this, um, but I do think that there is this uh, possibility, certainly, mm -hmm. that, that, that translation can really promote understanding across cultural, not only linguistic, but cultural barriers. So, I mean, for, for that only, I'd be wanting to do translation studies again. Mm -hmm. And I think the, uh, the lessons from what we're doing apply much more broadly. They apply to other areas of linguistic pursuits also. Mm -hmm. We're struggling to find out about reading, for instance, now. We're struggling to find out about writing. And of course, without reading and writing, there's no way that you can begin to study uh, translation. So what kinds of problems should we be posing and working on? In translation or studies? Or should, or should we just be getting data? No, no, no. We want, uh, well, what I'm after um, is probably impossible, uh, but we want to understand the cognitive processes mm -hmm. um, that um, make translation possible. Um, so what we're asking fundamentally is what makes human semiosis possible how is it that we generate all of this meaning mm -hmm. and that we're able to generate it? I think this is uh, perpetually interesting and it's very much what makes us human, both 
the, the meaning that we're able, we're like wellheads, so constantly producing symbiosis, um, but also making meaning for, out of other people's behavior and making meaning out of objects and everything. Uh, we invest with meaning. So to me, this is what makes us human and studying that in the broadest sense and not only by means of technology uh, would be, sorry, would be something that I would uh, always want to be part of. Good. Thanks very much. Well, thank you.